from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. We have an update for our listeners. Jacob and I are now on day 65 with no sushi. How long will this madness last? We will discuss this and other topics on today's show. And now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pot therapy. Yeah, somebody the other day on, on our social media brought up something about sushi. And that yeah. was the one thing you, you immediately launched into. Is you're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, thank you for telling me about that. I, I rarely ever check our Twitter. Yeah. I just happen to be on it right there. And it's uh-huh. like, within 30 seconds, I'm responding to that right that's away. That's funny. Like, yeah, you know what? We haven't had our sushi yet. Thank that's you right. for bringing that that's, up. That's the real crime that's occurred here. So, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you know what? If, if But... It, what we could do is we could circle it to next year since we're almost there and we could double or nothing. And then if you win, like I will hire like one of those like people who lays naked on a table and we serve the sushi on them. Yeah. Or you won't. <laughs> we just That's... keep doubling it, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm good for Let's this. Let's not rule that out. <laughs> not enough. I want my sushi on Jim. <laughs> I don't Tell want, it's worth I don't want you hiring anybody. <laughs> you lay down and you just sit there Here's and Here's a banana leaf. <laughs> Here's a... No, you get nothing. Thank you, by the way, for giving me the benefit of the doubt on the banana leaf. Uh, oh, it's for your face. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I was about to say. No, that's very generous. Thank you. Not, not this tiny little, you know, here's a clover. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> so we are officially in June. It is the uh, first or second week of June uh, mm-hmm. when this taping is happening. And really interesting things are happening. Um, with May being Mental Health Month, it, it was a huge opportunity for national conversation uh, for the governments of both America and Nevada to talk about uh, laws that were going to pass. And there was um, a slurry of laws in our home state here in Nevada that uh, ultimately went through that had to do with mental health. And, and there was one of them, which I had my eye on and, and I had my finger on the pulse of you know throughout its process. And uh, it was actually championed by former uh, guest on our show, uh, Jake Wiskirchen, who is the president of the MFT CPC board and that dude who brought us beer, which right. was nice. Yeah. It was good beer. Micro Brewer. Yeah. So, it would uh, be great if we could get him on the show again sometime. If, if only we could. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? I have him on the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, appearing for the second time on Pod Therapy, we have got president of the Board of Examiners of Nevada for Marriage and Family Therapists and Clinical Professional Counselors, owner of Zephyr Wellness, a Reno-based mental health clinic, host of Noggin Notes, a mental health-themed podcast, blogger with Reno Dads, a collective of fathers talking about fatherhood. He is our co-conspirator for Mental Health Law and Action and our personal micro-brewer. Everybody, please welcome back President Jake Wiskirchen. Hi, Jake. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so Jake lost the bet, and so he's here. <laughs> but Jake, we're really excited Although to have bet, you back. The bet did not include not eating sushi for yeah. two months, but I must admit that I, I just had sushi two days ago for the first time in what felt like about seven years. Not nice. So, man, well, my... Uh, My heart goes off to you or my hand comes out at you or something like that. (laughs) Well, I should clarify, Jake, because the bet was on March Madness and Jacob and I won... Jim lost. He owes us sushi, and it has now been sixty-five days oh. and still no sushi. You know, it's a good thing March. we don't have like an interest. That's pretty policy. boochy, man. I know <laughs> it's pretty boochy. <laughs> <laughs> Last time Jake was here, we all went and got sushi. Yeah, that was fun. That's yeah. true. That's yeah, true. we're due that for fun. that, man. We're due for that. Uh, see, we like it when you come to town. You come with beer. We get sushi. It's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Instead of just you know, you get you get licenses for people who don't qualify. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Last time we that's had right. you sign Nick's license. Yeah. I actually tried to play that clip on uh, on at this like CEU conference, and Jake, I don't think was in the room, and I was trying to do it, and YouTube wasn't working, but it was really funny because I was trying to show everybody like, hey, you know, there's yeah. a way to get a license. You could skip the whole process. Just, yeah. You know, swindle Jake. It's fine. It looks nice on my wall, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Photocopy of a photocopy of a yeah. photocopy going sideways. Yeah. Yeah, it counts. It's, like, outdated and has, like, the wrong members on it, but whatever. So, President Jake, you are uh, the president of the Board of Examiners for Marriage and Family Therapists and Clinical Professional Counselors. 
Um, so technically, you are one of the people who is uh, responsible to oversee me and make sure that I don't do anything mm-hmm. stupid in the community. And, and technically, you are one of the people who actually has authority um, to discipline me and take away my license and things like that. And so uh, we are here to treat you with the utmost respect. <laughs> to yeah. do best uh, behavior I, I today. I feel like coming through the phone. Yeah. <laughs> So you and I, uh, I live down here in the south end of Nevada in, in Las Vegas. You you live up in Reno. And um, you and I, we, we conspire together on a lot of interesting mental health projects, things that matter to our state, things that matter to the country. Um, we try to keep an eye out on law. And, and recently in Nevada, there was this, this law that, that kind of came through, and this was something that you were absolutely instrumental in advocating for. And in Nevada, we called it Senate Bill 37. And this is something that, that you had a huge hand in and is something I want to dive into. It's the reason why we wanted to bring you on the show because we want to talk about this thing that, that ultimately did pass. But in order to understand that, we know that we have to kind of teach the audience a little bit about what this bill sort of had to do with. And so, like, the, the first question we kind of wanted to launch with is sort of talking about this concept in our professions of, of scopes of practice. Like, a lot of people think that there's something called a therapist. And then that's it. There's like a therapist and like we just help people. But it, the behind the scenes of like what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do and what types of professions we're in actually is a little bit more complicated than like John Q. Public understands. And so, you know, who better to, to kind of take us through some of that and help us understand some of the history of that and, and like what we're talking about when we're talking about scopes than, than the guy who really governs that, at least, you know, for two of the professions in Nevada. So can, take us through that a little bit, Jake. Teach us a little bit about what are scopes of practice and, and sort of what's some of the history about the professions of mental health that exist. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, first of all, thanks for having me back. Uh, all cheekiness aside, I do appreciate what you guys do. I think that um, w- when people get an opportunity to get an informal exposure to what counseling is like through the, the format that you both offer, I think it, it just serves to elevate everyone, honestly. Um, there's so many people out there who don't have access to what we would call formalized, you know, traditional mental health, which is you go you go into an office and sit down with a clinician and talk to them, and they they bill your insurance, they render a diagnosis. I think I think that that's that often overshoots what's necessary for most people, but it also um, it also fails to meet people where they are. And these days, with technology and global communication, I think that that the availability of podcasts and just doing simple case studies like you guys do so frequently. Uh, it helps to arm people to solve their own problems, which is really what we want to do anyway. We don't want people languishing in counseling, you know, in perpetuity. Um, that that creates a dependent relationship that's unethical. Um, we we just don't want that. We want people healed and healthy and walking alone, you know, on their own, not alone, but in community on their own, so that they can, you know, live life to the fullest without having to maintain weekly therapy sessions for years upon years. So I think that you're you guys are really Thanks, doing a, a great service to the community. And I appreciate what you do because ultimately when people get the information they need, however they get it, whether it's through, you know, formal psychotherapy or through podcasts, articles, books, um, self-help sessions, seminars, whatnot, Ted talks. Um, if everybody heals, we all end up better. So thank you for having me back. Wow. I, I, I enjoy being here. Thanks, guest, man. So. And, and I look forward um, to playing this recording yeah. back to you during a future disciplinary hearing. <laughs> yeah, I will be off the board by then because I can't resignation. <laughs> Are you about tournament. to term out? Are you terming out? Yeah, I am. Ah, oh, damn it. I did one term. <laughs> there I goes my safety term, net. And, uh, and that was enough. Yeah. Oh, crap. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's been great, there Jake. Goes, there goes your Good, goodbye. There goes your <laughs> You're no longer yeah. useful to me. <laughs> Tell the next president I to call my... into the show. <laughs> oh, good. I get my Sunday back. Uh, there you go again. Bailing out of intimate, intimate moments. Yeah. Uh, seriously. So, yeah Don't you psychoanalyze me, damn it. But... <laughs> uh, we, we barely know each other. That's funny. Um, <laughs> So for, but back to the back to the point for the listening audience, um, the uh, the professions that exist in our field are varied and diverse, but they can essentially be boiled down to about six uh, six people who reasonably can be lumped under the umbrella of um, quote unquote you know mental health clinicians. So so at the I guess the top of the education chain you've got uh, medical doctors who are psychiatrists and they can do psychotherapy. 
and they also can prescribe. And then uh, under under them, you also have in the medical profession uh, advanced practicing nurses. They can do psychotherapy. They can also prescribe medication. And then you have psychologists. That's a doctoral degree also. Um, usually PhD, sometimes an EDD, which is a doctorate of education. And then you have, um, and these are just all kind of in the same realm, marriage and family therapists, licensed professional or clinical professional counselors in, in Nevada, they're CPCs, but professional counselors, clinical social workers, and then alcohol and drug counselors. And I'm not going to get into the weeds about the, the particulars of, of the, um, the various iterations of those, but the idea is that they all have a track to um, go to school, get out, get an internship, get a license, uh, and then and then they even become supervisors of, of fledgling clinicians. So uh, broadly, the the story is such that um, in our in our field, and this is this is relevant. I'll stick to what Senate Bill thirty seven or SB thirty seven did. Um, historically. The professional counselor originated in the eastern part of the United States and moved west. The marriage and family therapist originated in California and then um, moved east. And so over the years, the two professions, as they identified themselves, discrete from one another, eventually overlapped. And in 2009, all states formally had both licenses present and valid to, to practice and to treat mental illness in uh, in America. So uh, the last state, I think, was Wyoming or Montana to to ver- uh, validate the, the professional counselor and the MFT simultaneously. So in Nevada, what we had was since 1999, this gets a little bit murky, so, so try to track with me here. In 1999, we had the marriage and family therapists the clinical professional count, I'm sorry, the marriage and family therapist, the clinical social workers, and the psychologists. They all had their different boards, and they all had their different scopes. And we also had uh, alcohol and drug counselors, uh, but, but they didn't um, they didn't have a credential at that point. So the three that, that had licenses from the state, meaning the state comes in and they, they have this regulatory body that uh, sets a minimum standard and then gives you a license as you meet minimum standards to go out and treat people, and we can reasonably assure that you're not going to hurt the public by doing so. So in 1999, there was a big fight among the three. And so goes the story as it's been told to me that the psychologists wanted to have all the MFTs work for them. Uh, and I don't, I, and again, if anybody takes umbrage with this, don't blame me. It's just how it's been handed down, but, but I've <laughs> talked to enough people to ascertain that, that it was more or less true. So what they did was they tried legislatively to get rid of the marriage and family therapy license and, do away with the ability of MFTs to treat and diagnose mental illness altogether. Now, keep in mind that in 1973, the marriage and family therapist license became a thing in Nevada. So it's from 73 to 99, they they were a thing. And then in 99 legislative session, there was this big fight. And what was left on the table after all the dust settled was that marriage and family therapists could, know, could treat mental illness, but they could not treat psychotic disorders. That would be the schizophrenias of the world and, and things associated with psychosis. So fast forward a few years, the, the professional counselors hit Nevada. Remember I was talking about how they, they overlapped across the nation. Well, in 2007, the professional counselors came to Nevada and they uh, successfully lobbied the legislature to create a license for them. And the legislature looked at the landscape and said, where would they best fit? Well, they, they best fit with marriage and family therapists. So they put them on the marriage and family therapy board, which later became the marriage and family therapy slash clinical professional counselor board. The marriage and family therapists at the time were not sure what to do with these folks. And they also had their own bailiwick, which was treating couples and families. So what they did was they said, great, clinical professional counselors, you can have a license, but you can't treat couples and families. Uh, now, mind you, everywhere else in America, professional counselors could do that. So in Nevada, now you got two disciplines in 2007, marriage and family therapist, clinical professional counselor who cannot treat psychotic disorders, and now you have a new discipline that can't treat couples and families. So let me jump in Over at that the last point. Several years. Yeah, go ahead. Let, and me, let me kind of summarize that and, and make sure I'm understanding it, because this is something a lot of listeners don't understand, is they just think, oh, I'm depressed, right, or I'm feeling anxious, or mm-hmm. I'm having a problem. And, and so they listen to a show like Pod Therapy, and we say, hey, go get help, right? Like, don't hesitate. 
But then they, there's this problem that at least a lot of folks have in different states and has always been a real problem in Nevada where there's the wrong door. And so you finally work up the right. courage and you finally show up in an office and you finally make an appointment and you sit down with this person and you don't know what the little initials after their name mean. And you sit down and you start to tell your story and they have to go, hey, let me stop you right there. Um, you're in the wrong place. You've gotten to the wrong person. Mm-hmm. You see, mm-hmm. you're describing a schizophrenic thing and I'm an MFT or I'm a CPC. I'm not allowed to touch that. Um, you need to go to an LCSW or you need to go to a psychologist. And then people think, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I thought you were a therapist. And it's like, oh no, 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 I am. Um, but I'm not allowed to touch these things. And it's like, oh, okay, why not? And it's always been hard to explain that, that it's like, no, it's not that I'm incompetent. I was fully trained in this and it's part of my licensure examination to prove that I'm competent in this. Um, basically another tribe voted me out. <laughs> and so what you're kind of describing, I think, Jake, and I want to make sure I'm getting it right, is like there's been this, at least in Nevada, but it's probably writ large, but especially in Nevada, there's been a tribalism where it's like, okay, the psychologists uh, kind of kicked the MFTs off of their turf, and then like the MFTs kicked the CPCs off of their turf. And, and so we've kind of had this distrust between the disciplines, and it's created that wrong door atmosphere, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a very accurate way of explaining it. The cool thing is that over the last couple of years, uh, I mean, I, I want to hedge that somewhat. Uh, it's not cool but because of the circumstances that brought it out. But what's cool is that the, 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 the several disciplines who all dif- have different licensing boards have come together, and they don't look you know, sideways at one another anymore. However, the reason for that camaraderie and that collegiality is because Nevada woke up and pulled its head out of the sand and realized it was ranked dead last in behavioral health care right. for two years running, 17 and 18. Now, we don't know what 2019 is going to bring about, but uh, this is done through Mental Health America. You can go to mentalhealthamerica.net and pull up the ranking the states report and find that for yourself. But um, essentially, we all got together and said, can we stop fighting? This is a 20-year-old battle that doesn't right. need to be fought anymore because it it, it – it quite literally drove us to the bottom because we stopped talking to each other. Right. So that was pretty cool. And that, and that helped pass this bill that we're about to discuss. Right. Yeah. So, so we're talking about Senate bill 37. So SB 37 and in preparation for this, mm-hmm. for this, Jake, I should, I should say that uh, in preparation for this, I went ahead and read SB one through 36 <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it turns out not very helpful. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of references to 37. Right, yeah. Even though 37 is so, a sequel. Yeah. It just does it builds yeah, on there, none there of are, it. You can't watch Rocky yeah, 5 without the first one. You could read too on right. both sides of the legislature too. Yeah. Right. Two yeah. houses, the Senate and the Assembly, and they both have 500 plus bills. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. So so the most significant piece to this one, to SB 37, uh we're we're talking about the mental health. You know, what are we're, we're talking about the scope of practice, right? So what would you say are the most significant things that this bill does? So what it did was it eliminated the restriction on professional counselors from being able to treat couples and families. And it eliminated the restriction, the restriction, excuse me, on MFTs and CPCs, marriage family therapists and clinical professional counselors from treating psychotic disorders. Uh, the, the National Psychological, I'm, I'm sorry, the Nevada Psychological Association, which is our local uh, uh, ad, interest group for the psychologists, was very friendly, um, very helpful in drafting some language that made everybody um, a lot a lot more comfortable now de- doing the psychotic disorder treatment and diagnosis because they, they do, the psychologists do get specialized treatment, or, um, sorry, I, training. I teach people to talk for a living, but <laughs> apparently when You're I'm, off I'm duty, one man. in my vacation mode and I <laughs> just right. forget how to speak. You're off duty. So, so the psychologists, when they go through school, they get specialized training in, specifically in psychotic disorder treatment and recognition. And what they wanted to make abundantly clear to us is that even though it's been 20 years, or maybe especially because it's been 20 years, uh, we're not just lifting this restriction and going all the oxen free on everybody who happens to hold a, a license to go treat psychotic disorders. They want to make very, very clear that there are certain medical complications that can go into this thing, and they want to make sure that we were adequately prepared. So I, I made some assurances that we would do things like podcasts to get the messaging out as well as newsletters and so forth say hey don't don't just go diving into treating schizophrenia if you've never done it before right. make sure that you've wrapped yourself in enough competency 
to do it well and you're not harming people. So those are the two major things. The, the, the two disciplines under our board now get to treat psychotic disorders and the professional counselors get to treat couples and families. And why this is significant is because 49 other states not named Nevada, all of which outrank Nevada in behavioral health care and treatment and availability, don't have those restrictions. So it's small wonder why we ended up at the bottom of the heap. And now, fortunately, we're going to be able to lift that. And I'm very excited about it. Yeah, I think the competency point is a really good point because I run into a lot of uh, a lot of folks, especially like LCSWs, that uh, you know, with an LCSW, you can treat. It's in the scope of practice. You can treat addictions, and you can treat. Uh, oh, they have the keys to the kingdom. <clears throat> well, LCSWs right, and they can, can do everything. They They'll could let them treat do surgery if they have a scalpel. They could. They could treat gambling <laughs> disorder. You know, but that's one of the things that we have to make sure that we educate everybody on is that well, just because you can't, you you have to demonstrate competency right. in that first before you can do it. You can't just have yeah. the license and go do it. And the important thing to, to point out to the listening audience is I do. So on Naga Notes, I have a podcast called Naga Notes. You can download it, listen to it. It's awesome. The host is amazing. <laughs> um, but, uh, I do a lot of uh, conversations about if you're a client, what should you expect from, from your therapy or your counseling? And I think what's important to note here is that while we have this scope of practice as dictated by the state to, to do whatever we want to do, there's an ethical piece yes. of this that says you should be competent first. And there's really no way of knowing that if you're one of the people seeking care except to ask and say, hey, are you really good at adolescence? Are you really good at right. working with families? Are you really good with the elderly? Are you really good with trauma or uh, you know, uh, transgender issues? You know, so, so you want to ask those things. And most people will have it on their profile as long as they haven't checked every box on the <laughs> website. website. Um, it's really hard to be competent in everything because there's only so many hours in the day. Right. But the idea is that you would you would ethically be good at what you do. And then if you're not, that's where the licensing board comes in. And unfortunately, harm usually has to befall someone before uh, you know a right. complaint can be filed. And it's very much like a, a criminal matter. We, we hope that everyone acts honorably in the streets. And unfortunately, the police don't come until somebody perpetrates their crime against well, another person. You're speaking person. That's to something like that I think is really important because a lot of times, at least in Nevada, and I think this has been true in other states too, what's happened is professions and, and the tribalism and the lobbyists, they've used the legislature and the power of the lawmaking pen to restrain each other from potentially doing harm out in the field, and they always coat that in, oh, I'm protecting the public. When in reality... Correct. We created these boards of colleagues who know what is clinical best practices, who are senior practicing clinicians, and it is by that standard that we get held accountable. If I go out and do something stupid and I cause harm, I'm going to get drug in front of the Board of Examiners of Nevada, and there's no lying to them. It's a group of professionals who are also MFTs and are also CPCs and are also consumers and members of the public, and I've got to give an account for why I did this, and if I ever did something that dumb... You would probably ask me, Jim, why do you can, you, can you explain to me, justify to me that you were competent to do what you said that you could do for this client? And then it's incumbent upon me to prove to the president of the board that, yeah, man, like, I, I feel like here's evidence, here's CEUs I've taken, here's classes I've taken, here's supervision I've had, you know, like, here's how I prove it. But, like, when we just pass laws that say, nope, you can't work with couples or families, that really sucked. And, and like, for me personally, speaking to what this law changed in my career, my master's degree is in marriage and family therapy from a regionally accredited university. It just wasn't in Nevada. And I'm one of those people that came to, you know, came to practice in this profession in Nevada and said, hi, I'm Jim. I'm here to be an MFT. And the, the existing board at that time said, sorry, dude, you're not qualified. And I was like, like, hell, I'm not qualified. I have a year of, you know, supervision and, and I did this master's degree and like I did everything. I've taken the exam like I'm ready to go. And they were like, sorry, man, you, you don't have enough of this particular class. And so you're donezo. You just can't practice here. So then I went over and said, okay, I'll be a clinical professional counselor. And I get in that door and they go, well, you can't talk to families or couples. And I was like, dude, I have a master's in marriage and family therapy. I'm qualified. And they were like, nope, that's the rules. So this really changed everything. By passing this law, it kind of takes away dumb governance and, and the tribalism and sort of allows best practices to prevail. And that's kind of what I hear you saying behind competency. 
we we trust that the benefit of the doubt goes to the professional. The benefit of the doubt goes to the profession. We're highly licensed, highly educated, highly experienced clinicians who who all live up to the Hippocratic Oath. It sounds like SB 37 sort of restores the benefit of the doubt to the practitioner and then allows competence and best practices to govern what we do. I really appreciate you saying that because that's that really was the spirit of it. Um, overly restrictive laws and regulations don't help the public. And I, I wanted to touch on the idea that licensing boards are created to protect the public. And I'm going to put that in air quotes because this isn't minority report. We can't just advance con- you know, convict somebody based on what we think they might do someday. Right. Um, it's really bizarre and, and paradoxical in a, in a field like ours where we're supposed to be ever evolving our learning and our training. And we believe in the power, the infinite power of a person to grow and, and do great things. We ourselves are quick to limit each other. Saying, right. Well, if you didn't have this one degree, <laughs> yeah. then there's no possible way after this line of demarcation, you could ever become good at something yeah. else. And it's very, very bizarre. But here's the other thing. So we, we have that line in our, in our statutes. It's a Nevada revised statute, chapter 641A, which governs MFTs and CTCs. And it, and it says the, the board is hereby created because these professions are deemed, you know, in the public interest and then they should protect the public. However, in another chapter that creates all licensing boards altogether, it, it says the pro- public interest shall also be promoted by these right. licensing boards. And we tend to just, you know, as guardians of the, of the profession, I suppose, we tend to leapfrog right over that and go, we, you know, we're the bulwark against all bad things. It's right. like, actually, you're supposed to be advocating, too. And when there's an, effectively a sign hung on the outside of Nevada borders that says close for business to yes. CPCs or LPCs as they're known everywhere else, we're not helping our people, especially in the rural communities who so desperately need more clinicians. Um, and there are people who want to work at places like Vitality Center and Elko and yet can't because they're arbitrarily restricted by statute. Right, right. and that's something for the listener, and, and I think for Nick too, one of the things that, that happened in inside baseball of Nevada politics and, and this Board of Examiners debate <clears throat> was that at some point, the Nevada legislature had passed a law that said, hey, you know, CPCs, you guys can now treat couples and families. This is ridiculous. And then the, the then existing president of the board, who was not named Jake, um, and I will not mention their name because uh, I don't want to be sued. But the, the then, then existing president got the, the legislature to add one extra little sentence to that law. And it said, at the discretion of the board of examiners. So, yes, you can treat as couples and families. As determined by the board. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> as determined by the board. And so I remember. Let me, let me, don't, don't tell me the ending. Let me guess. <laughs> Go ahead. The board said no to anybody who yeah! tried to do it. Yeah, I'll be damned. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happened was the spirit of this law was like, hey, we're hurting. Nevada sucks. Like, we need these guys to be able to do more. CPCs, you can see couples and families as determined by the board. And then immediately the board sent out a memo. And I remember, I have it still, but it was signed by the president. And it said, hi, everybody. So the law says you guys can treat couples and families now. I get to determine what you have to do. So here's the quick little route you need to do to prove that you're competent to, pr- to do couples and families. Number one, go get a master's in marriage and family therapy. <laughs> Number two, complete 1,500 hours of supervi- supervision under an MFT. <laughs> Number three, take the MFT national exam. And I was like, dude, what the hell just happened? I got to say, I'm completely on that guy's side. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It was a freaking coup. Let's let's keep Jim from talking to people. Yeah, let's keep Jim away from people. uh, A big part of why this changed, I should should point out, the big part of why this changed is because that regulation that they passed to, um, to, by by which you would be determined competent, um, effectively was against statute. It was, it was, um, it, oh, it was a power it, grab. It was not only against the spirit of it, but here's the thing. Our board only has the ability to issue four licenses, MFT, CPC, MFT intern, CPC intern. You can't issue a CPC with an asterisk. <laughs> yeah, because diet the, CPC. The public has no idea <laughs> what it means. Right. So you can't issue a CPC with an asterisk. You issue a CPC license, it's a CPC license. Um, so there, there's no way effectively to tell the public that they have a restricted scope. Right. Therefore, it, 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 the whole thing falls apart. So, so Jake, what's that was, interesting, that, was a big, that, was that, a big problem. that that thing that I just described, that coup and that legislative thing that had happened, and our, and our Nevada legislature only meets every two years, so it takes a while for the stuff to get rectified. But when that went down, that's one of the things that got you 
um, seeking service on the MFTCPC board was to right these wrongs and and kind of amend these problems that were that were fixable. They were things that the president of the board had done and a new president could undo. And so you and a number of people kind of joined that board to make it right. And then you now, at the end of your term, have not only done that, but you've now shepherded new laws through the legislature to basically prevent that from happening again so that whenever you term out, the next president doesn't get a wild hair up their butt and just basically destroy mental health in Nevada at the, the stroke of a pen. You've now made it so that you know the, the clinicians of Nevada can faithfully and honestly practice their craft and that the citizens of Nevada – can have reliable access to care, and, and, and we've greatly reduced the, the wrong door problem. You've taken that away. And so, man, I just want to tell you, you know, as a clinician in this state, as uh, also the recently elected president of the Nevada Counselor Association, man, we are so grateful I was for gonna, you. I was going to pump you up, but you pumped yourself up. <laughs> oh, I usually am reliably going to do that. Yeah. But no, man, for real, we are so grateful that you, you stepped into that leadership role, and, you know, you're going to term out here pretty soon, but... Holy crap, brother, in one term, you, you really changed mental health access in our state, and you left a hell of a footprint, and, and we are so grateful that you did that. I appreciate that, and I want to make clear that, that it has nothing to do with me being the chair of the board. Any citizen can advance any piece of legislation that they want. It just it just made it a little easier because I have this perceived authority in the eyeballs of you know other right. people that, you know, when, and I... I I'm a seminal document geek, so I sat down and I hand wrote uh, a lot of this <laughs> stuff, you know, in my own computer, and then I pursued it. But anybody, anybody could do this. And by the way, the entire board has to—well, not the entire board; it's got to be fifty percent plus one. But the entire board did uh, on four separate occasions when we advanced this uh, bill in its in its framework initially, and then in its concept form, and then its bill draft form, and then finally in bill form unanimously voted every single time for all the changes that we we advanced so this isn't this wasn't just jake's board right. examiners or jake's cool idea i mean nine people all rang in unanimously four separate times over the course of about a 15 month period that said yeah we need to do this so um as much as i'd love to take the credit and it makes me feel good i i can't <laughs> I, I did a lot of hard work i will take credit for the very hard work that i did but but the idea the concept the you know the I mean, I'm not. I don't vote nine times. I vote right. once. And right. if if the other eight people thought it was a bad idea, they would have said so. So um, mm-hmm. this wasn't this was a no brainer, honestly. Well, it but was a no brainer that was a kudos. long time coming, man. And it's going to change real experiences and real health care in the state of Nevada. And you know, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on, Jake, was. I think to teach the listeners, because we, we are advocates of mental health. We don't just answer their questions and give them ideas. We want to change access to care. And it's so powerful mm-hmm. because here you are, John Q. Citizen, who found a volunteer role on a board and then you know wrote legislation and put it through. And now the, the course of history and access to care is going to be changed in the state of Nevada. And, you know, we are going to go from last place to hopefully climbing up the ladder a little bit in our access to mental health care, brother. And, um, you know, I just want to shine a light on your work and shine a light on you and also the board and also the rest of the members of the board, you as a representative of them. And just to say, if you're a listener of this show and you, you're frustrated with health care and you're frustrated with mental health care and you, you don't feel it's properly funded or you don't feel that there's good access to it, let Jake and, and the other board members' story be an example to you. You can take control of your state laws, and you can get involved, and you can make a difference that could change the lives of millions of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome, man. So last, before we let you go, um, I had, I had kind of teased this idea that you are part of the Reno Dads, and, and uh, you know, I want to make sure we have time to get to our other questions. But I wanted to ask you, you know, when this airs, it's going to be just a few days before Father's Day. Well, you got plans? What are you doing on Father's Day, man? I'm actually going to be in South Dakota with my uh, wife's family. Oh, it's, cool! Uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah, we're uh, we're going to be there, and we're going to be hanging out with her dad and uh, her brothers, who are both dads. So there will be four of us, effectively, who are dads, and nice. I'm, I'm excited about it. But Reno Dads is really cool. If you go to RenoDads.com, you, you, you don't have to live in Reno, but it helps because a lot of what we cover is local. Um, but um, we we write articles and we have a podcast also and we interview other dads and we talk about a broad ranging variety of topics 
that have to do with fatherhood and child rearing, parenting, and all sorts of stuff. My my per, my specific uh, lane, I guess you could say, is the mental health lane. So I write a lot about emotional functioning and that kind of thing. But we we cover a ton of topics from safety and security to our own nervousness to bringing new kids into the world. Um, all sorts of stuff. It's not just uh, you know what cool things can you do around town, but we we truly try to to be a an advice pipeline for dads all over the place. Yeah, no, it's a really great website, Reno Dads. And then also, if uh, listeners, if you want to find out more about Jake, if you want to hear more about his stuff, uh, Jake has an excellent podcast. It's called Noggin Notes. That's N-O-G-G-I-N, Notes. And if you just open up the episode description on this one that you're listening to for pod therapy, uh, we will have a link to all of Jake's stuff, including Reno Dads. And um, if you want to hear more about uh, Noggin Notes, it's a great podcast. It's one of Nick and I's favorite podcasts. Yeah. If, if, you, if you love pod therapy but wish it was helpful... Check out Noggin Notes. <laughs> if you were like, man, you know, pot therapy gets a lot of near misses, you know, like go to Noggin Notes because the ball gets right over the rim and every once in a while you get something useful. So check out Noggin Notes. This is uh, with president of the board, a former about to be president of the board, Jake Wiskirchen. And uh, you can also see him on Twitter. What's your uh, Twitter uh, uh, handle, Jake? You know, I don't, I, I stopped tweeting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I stopped tweeting healthy. back last October. I mean, it's that with Jake Whisk. You can just right. find that. But um, I stopped get, being on Twitter because I found it was just really unhealthy for my psyche. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah. I was getting, I was getting just exposed to too much uh, negativity and firebombing of anonymous people to other people. It, it was just spreading too much hurt. And yeah, I, right. I didn't want that in my psyche. I found that I've been a lot healthier since I got off Twitter. Well, um, all right. Yeah, I, so. I, I message received. I will stop adding you. <laughs> I guess it was me. <laughs> I guess that was all me. Well, Jake, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you for passing SB 37. Thank you for your service to the state of Nevada, and thank you for being an advocate for mental health. Yeah, man. Um, and thank you for stepping in that leader position. Yeah, boy, this is just not going to great radio, isn't it? <laughs> They're used to really low standards on pot therapy. It's fine. <laughs> But thank you, thank you specifically, Jim, for stepping in that leadership position with Nevada Counseling Association because it fills a void, um, especially since the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy dissolved all of its state chapters about a year and a half ago. Right. There is no more advocacy group for MFTs, so I'm hoping that we all end up joining the ACA and then we can continue promoting good things. But th- right. thank you for stepping up. I, I think Thanks, things man. are coming in. Nick, well, that's what I hope it does. Um, yeah, and Nick, I was going to give you some kudos, but I don't have any. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, Good luck um, on getting your sushi, Just, uh, Just think of some for next time. <laughs> Rain check on that. <laughs> Jake, thanks so much, man. Grateful to talk to you. I'll be talking to you soon, okay? Later, brother. All Bye. Right, take care, guys. All right, so that was a lot of fun. Awesome stuff, getting Jake on the show. Always love having him around. I was glad he brought up the, uh, the Nevada uh, Counseling Association thing because – um, you just recently became the president of that. I did. And I was, I was certain if he hadn't brought that up, I was certain that that was a group that you created so <laughs> just that you so could, I could become be the, president? the president of it. <laughs> I didn't know it was a real thing. So that's it good is to a know. real thing. Damn it. <laughs> good to know. I feel a lot better now. Yeah. No, you've been validated. <laughs> I'm thrilled. I think I'm going to be the president of one of these things. Yeah, you should. <laughs> just jump in. It's fine. It's really apparently, easy. Apparently anyone can do it. Yeah. You just unanimously <laughs> vote for yourself. It's super easy. So anyway. So like, and when we come back, we discuss sexual connection and relationship counseling. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's Thera Producer Sponsor is Smitty Scoop. Smitty is an American singer, songwriter, musician, actor, producer, author, poet, and activist. The critical success of the album Shotgun Willie in 1973, combined with the critical and commercial success of Redheaded Stranger in 75 and Stardust in 78, made Smitty one of the most recognized artists in country music. He was one of the main figures of outlaw country, a subgenre of country music that developed in the late 1960s as a reaction to the conservative restrictions of the Nashville sound. Smitty has acted in over 30 films, co-authored several books, and has been involved in activism for the use of biofuels and the legalization of marijuana. If you'd like to join Smitty, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. 
We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is about sexual connection and relationship counseling. Hey guys, I wrote in earlier this year about my husband and I being depressed in our marriage, which aired on episode 59. My husband had lost his job, lost his mother and stepfather, and also had to sever ties with his stepbrothers and put some much-needed boundaries up with the rest of the extended family. My husband found a job shortly after I emailed you guys, and things have gotten better. One big thing that helped was letting him listen to the episode where you read my letter. It was very hard to let him know exactly how I'd been feeling, mostly because I was afraid he would get mad and lash out. I gave him a heads up that I had written in, and you guys were going to read it, and that it was going to be hard to listen to. It was no secret to him we were in a bad place, but it really opened his eyes to the fact that I was hurting just as much as he was. We talked openly and honestly after that, listened to one another, and made sure that the other person knew we were listening by acknowledging not only what they said, but how they felt. I will admit I am very bad at that, especially when I'm feeling hurt and or attacked by the other person. During our bad year, I had started listening to a few mental health podcasts, including yours, religiously. It became my form of counseling since I couldn't go to therapy since we were without insurance. While listening to these podcasts and trying to pull whatever I could out of them to help our marriage, I discovered I have intimacy issues. I think we both do. And he has rejection and abandonment issues, which totally feed into one another. It's a vicious cycle. I had noticed, and so we talked and pointed out that we saw in ourselves and what we saw in one another. It was nice to be able to openly share without fear of retaliation, and it was the reassurance he needed to see that I do care and I'm here for him. The biggest struggle, and he has been since, and has been since we had our first kid nine years ago, has been being intimate in the bedroom. During the last rough patch of our alone time, it was going very rarely, like two to four times a month. And that was hard for him because he viewed that as I don't want him and I'm not attracted to him. He knows that's not true. We have been down this road before and he knows I know his love language and that's his number one language. Having our third kid and then piling on all the horrible crap that we had gone through and throwing in his deep sadness and anger just erased my libido. And I was finally able to tell him exactly why I wasn't doing it when he wanted to. In the past, I would, and I'm okay with that when we are in a good place, but when I'm in a place where I don't feel emotionally safe with him, it triggers childhood trauma that I have, which at the time I didn't realize I had, but after learning I have issues, it became clear why I felt so uncomfortable with being intimate. Sharing that scary, deep, intimate part of my emotions was hard because it was like being intimate with him in bed. What if I tell him this thing I am struggling with and he gets mad, throws it in my face later, makes passive-aggressive comments, and tries to make me feel worse than I already do? But he didn't do that, and I told him it will take time, but that part of our marriage will get better as long as we communicate and are honest with one another. And it has. So present day, we are doing okay. Our relationship itself is much better, but he is still struggling with his depression. His new work hours take a toll on him, and he doesn't get much sleep, partly because he has horrible anxiety. He gets all these bad thoughts about things that are out of his control or things he beats himself up about and that he has taken care of around the house or about our kids or about how crappy parents we are or how we're failing in life. Guilt and anxiety consume him at all hours of the night and a lot of his issues revolve around guilt. He feels guilt over anything and everything, but what is weird is this doom and gloom mood fluctuates. He will have days where he is happy and everything is fine and he is hopeful. It makes it really hard because he will say how he feels or what he thinks one day and then the next day or a week later it will change and he will say that he never said that or that he didn't mean it that way. It's what causes a lot of arguments, honestly. He is aware he has done this in the past, but it all depends on his mood if we will talk or if he will admit this type of behavior. We're starting our marriage counseling tomorrow and we are both looking forward to it. Thanks, Cindy. Awesome. That's great. They're starting counseling. That is awesome. And and quick side note on this, too. Um, she had sent this to us in May and had included um, a, a description of her own mental health history and her own mental health story because we were encouraging people to share their stories. Um, I didn't want to read it on air because it's, it's a little long for the show, um, but I'm actually going to copy it into the episode description. So if you open up this description, you will see an area that says Cindy's story, and you can read her own writing about herself and her mental health history. Great. Thank you for writing in, Cindy. So a few things that she was kind of talking about, um, I guess with his depression, fluctuates up and down. Yes. Pretty normal. Yes. Right? Yeah, super normal. And anxiety fluctuates as well. 
And and so, like, in that case, I think that's what can make it really a strain on relationships. And when we think about anxiety and depression, a lot of times we think of it as an individual problem because you're suffering, right? Like, when I'm anxious, I'm suffering. Right. But what we don't talk about enough is that when I'm anxious, my wife is suffering. Like, it causes problems, you know, in our right. ecosystem, in our relationship. My kids suffer, you know, because I'm I'm keyed up, I'm worried, and so I'm yelling at them, you know, get down off that thing, you know, walk away. And then my wife has to, like, grab my arm sometimes and say, Jim, they're just being kids, man. Like, they're right. okay. They're not in danger. And, like, I have this huge paranoia that, like, they're going to get hurt or something bad's going to happen. And so, like, it, it shows up all the time. Right. And so what she's talking about here is, I think, really something a lot of people can relate to because if your spouse is suffering, that causes the relationship to suffer. And then she talks about her own past stuff and how she's starting to become aware of her personal intimacy issues, her past traumas, and how that influences the relationship. And how all of this, Nick, comes back to this question of chemistry and sex. She's saying we're not having as much sex as he wants. It's his number one love language. I, like, logically understand that, and I, like, logically know that I should be doing something about that. But sex isn't like baking a cake. It's not like, hey, I know that cake is your love language, so... I'll do it and I can do it in a bad mood. Like, right. no, you yeah. really can't. Like, sex is this, like, <laughs> you can, intimate but... self expression. <laughs> yeah, you can. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> but that's something to talk about, right? Is like the connection between sex being this thing. <laughs> I love that. This is why I don't buy you drinks. <laughs> Sorry. I did, I, it looks like there's more in there than that. There I didn't wasn't. think it was going <laughs> to. But let's speak to that, Nick. Like, when we think about how we can bring sexual connection to a relationship, when we're not feeling it and like how do we bridge that gap well i think a lot of it has to do with preparation too like you know being able to identify as she talked about like there are certain things that if she's feeling a certain way then she has recognized that that brings up issues from her past that brings up past trauma issues that brings up things from her childhood and so it, you kind of it's you, you kind of have to know that in advance, and you have to prepare for it. It's almost kind of like um, getting a, a a plant to grow. You know, right. you, you, the conditions have to be right, and you have to make sure that you're watering it. You have to make sure it's getting enough sunlight. You have to make sure it's doing all these different things. You can't just plant the seed and be like, "Why do I not have a plant yet?" Right. You know. So, you know, in that relationship aspect, being able to understand, like, okay, these are the things that. I know if these conditions are happening or if I'm doing these certain things, it's going to create a response. Right. So I need to be mindful of what I'm doing. And you can't, it's not manipulation in a sense. It's not like no. you shouldn't go about doing these things like I'm going to, I'm going to be nice to her. I'm going to get her this thing so she'll sleep with me. (laughs) It's, it's more just because this creates the situation that I'm, that I want. It's cultivating. And you know, this, I think, and I'm glad she wrote in about that. And I'm glad that she kind of revealed a little bit about some of this nuance of sex. This is something I think that we do not talk enough about. And I think being a male therapist, there's a lot of men that I interact with who are one half of a couple. And they'll share their truth. And a lot of times men don't know how to language their need for sex. Because society makes a joke out of it. It's a cartoon. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, okay, well, guys want sex because they're all Neanderthals and they don't care. And it's this passive, primitive thing. And then, you know, women don't have to give that or whatever. And if you say, hey, you have to give me sex or I'm not happy in this relationship, you're a bad person. And then it's like, hey, you know, what kind of terrible man would, uh, you know, only give emotional intimacy or only be connected to his wife or his partner if he's getting laid. Right. What a terrible man. Right. And, and of course, I want to challenge that, right? Because when she talks about, I can't have sex with him unless the emotional climate is nourishing and positive. And we, a lot of us would nod to that. And I think a lot of female listeners would get that and go, yeah, yeah, I get it. Like, you know, if, if mm-hmm. things are toxic between you, you're not in the mood. And what a lot of people don't appreciate is the complexity that the other opposite is also true. That sometimes a male will pull back and isolate from a relationship and will not nourish the emotional intimacy of the relationship because that physical need is not happening. And But we don't call it that. A lot of times we just think, no, no, sex is like this fun thing that like, you know, it's like getting pizza. It's a privilege, not a right. It's like this, you don't need it. It's not nourishing. And I feel that that disrespects what we understand to be incarnate humanity and like right. biological imperatives. It is an instinctual drive in a lot of – I'm not just going to generalize and say only men. A lot of women need that too. Right. But it's important because I think it's one of these things that American society is super uncomfortable talking about. And so we want to create this window dressing of like we're allowed to talk about sex if and only if we water that down with something else. 
And so when we meet a relationship that's that's struggling in sexuality, a lot of times it's important to understand, as you said, Nick, the entire ecosystem that's happening and like how do we set the stage to create sexuality, but then also challenge ourselves to see this as something that we have to be careful, right? It's a catch-22. It's a cart and a horse thing, and it's so a lot of times we say, if if you this, then I sex you, and right. we have to somehow work on that because it's got to be all at once, and we can't have this exchange of goods kind of mentality. Right. A lot of men give up, and a lot of men get discouraged, and they don't know how to language that need because no matter what, they seem like a villain in a Hallmark movie, and so like they just kind of pull away, and a lot of times they get silent, and they get really depressed. And that's something I want to give to the writer, too, is a little bit of feedback that when you're describing him coming home and being depressed or, or sometimes being uh, fearful and feeling guilty and, and being worrisome, sometimes if you know that, that physical contact is his number one love language, that's a medicine that you can also offer your mate. And, and it's this nonverbal, non-complicated thing that soothes. And it's not bad. Offer mm-hmm. that if you can, if you can, if you can't then obviously the right trajectory is to get into counseling and try to work on the things that are preventing you from being intimate. Right, which that's, I think, one of the big takeaways from this, too. I was glad to hear that, like, this is ideally how I'd like our podcast to go, is to kind of be able to help people out, to right. kind of for them to self-explore, and to be able to kind of bridge the gap from where they are now until when they get into counseling. Right, yeah. And I think this is a great example of how that happened. It's crazy because in May, we got a lot of stuff like this. You know, mm-hmm. obviously we kicked it up a notch in May. We tried to do a lot more. We were banging this drum of mental health awareness. And a lot of letters like this came in where people basically said, and it's incredibly flattering when people say, hey, I couldn't talk to my my spouse. So I funneled my thoughts through pod therapy and got you guys to talk about it at us. And, like, that was meaningful. Like, we're doing better. <laughs> like, we're going to therapy now. How many people have written the show and told us, hey, I listened to you guys. I booked a time. Like, I'm going to go see a therapist. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've got tons of stories like that. And, guys, that is just, I mean, honestly, one of the most powerful things I think we could get as hosts is to realize this project is not just entertaining. It's making a real-life impact in people's real stories and families. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Cindy, thank you so much for writing in about that. And, again, if you want to read her larger story, um, that will be available in the episode description. You can check that out, and uh, you can hear all about her, her background story. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to do our announcements and closing. So you're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's Their Producer Sponsor is Jake Schneider. Jake was one of the 12 Olympians in ancient Greek religion and myth. He was god of the sea and other waters, of earthquakes, and of horses. In pre-Olympian Bronze Age Greece, he was venerated as chief deity of Pylos and Thebes. His Roman equivalent is Neptune. Jake was protector of seafarers and of many Hellenic cities and colonies. In Homer's Iliad, Jake supports the Greeks against the Trojans during the Trojan War. In the Odyssey, during the sea voyage from Troy back home to Ithaca, the Greek hero Odysseus provokes Jake's fury by blinding his son, the Cyclops, Polyphemus, resulting in, pus- in Jake <laughs> punishing him with storms, <laughs> the complete loss of his ship and companions, and a 10-year delay. <laughs> you almost blew it. If you know who Jake really is, jump onto our Patreon.com slash therapy and let us know in this episode's uh, commentary who you think Jake was. Again, that's Patreon.com slash therapy. We're back. <laughs> And that sound means that we're at the end of our episode. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do we have any announcements? I think Jacob does. (laughs) Yeah, I have nothing to say. (laughs) We do have some announcements. When this episode airs, this is why it's so funny, because whenever I texted you guys and I said, hey, can I get you guys anything from Starbucks? And, of course, you texted back and said something very sexual, which I thought was odd and uncalled for, but... It, it was what it was. It's not sexual to anybody else. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> Jacob thought it was sexual. You said, let's do butt stuff. <laughs> What's sexual about that? <laughs> I just didn't see it coming. <laughs> you just got me. You never do. No. <laughs> That's why you have to wear eye protection. <laughs> So you're in the splash zone. Oh, so anyway, but this is why I don't buy you things from Starbucks because you can't help but drink it right into the microphone. So this is this is why I can't trust you. Yeah. Well, 
It is what it is. We do have announcements. Uh, when this episode is airing, uh, the, the upcoming Sunday will be Father's Day. And uh, we started a tradition. I started a tradition last year on Father's Day um, to read excerpts from my book that I've been writing now for nigh a decade. Uh, the book is called Love, Dad. It's not published anywhere. <laughs> I'm still Wait, working on it. Wait, how old are your kids? Nine. So I've been working on it since I found out we were pregnant. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I, I thought for some reason I was thinking your son was seven, and you've been working on this for a decade. Ten, ten, and I'm like, no. Mm. no, my kids are nine and four. You're, so I, okay. when I found out we were pregnant with my son, I started working on the project. But I guess that makes more sense. If you were writing one as a single guy, it'd be, it'd be like, odd. Uh, yeah, I've always wanted to be a dad. A little creepy. No. <laughs> so I will be reading some excerpts from that. I'm only going to post it on Patreon this year, but on Father's Day, you guys will see that go live. If you go to Patreon.com/therapy and sign up for as little as a buck, you can hear me narrating some of my book and just sharing some passages from it. It's just little excerpts uh, that have to do with, like, fatherly wisdom and things like that that hopefully are useful. Also, our book club technically exists. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're reading uh, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone right. by Lori Gottlieb. And uh, we have been doing pretty good. Uh, I think we have four installments that are up there. If you haven't already uh, found them, you can go up to patreon.com slash therapy. And I think you just search book club and you'll see all of our stuff come up. Um, we missed the last one and, uh, we're working on it. Summertime is here. So yeah. it's, it becomes a little bit more intermittent because of vacations and stuff. Uh, but we have not forgotten about book club. So if you are waiting on the next installment, uh, feel free to read ahead and then just kind of flick back whenever we post that kind of stuff and you can kind of hear our thoughts on it, but great book. Um, and hopefully we can continue to do more with book club. Yeah. And we want to thank our Patreons who support the show at www.patreon.com slash therapy. We want to thank the three-toed reptilian special forces of our therapeutic alliance, the Therapods. And thanks for joining us, Oki Scoop and David Pollock. So David has actually been with us for a while. And you know what? It's funny because in our last episode, it was the first one of the month where I thank all the Therapods. And I was going through that list over and over again to see if I missed anybody. And I, when I listened to the episode again, I was like, I missed David. So David was the one I missed. And in reaction to not being named... He upped his pledge. <laughs> he went from 888 to 1111. I'll get their attention by God. Yeah, and so he, he will be damned. And so he pushed it up a notch. And I have to go back and check the numbers, but he might be really close to the Alpha Theropod now. Because somebody else had taken over the Alpha Theropod role huh. by getting above Ice Blue Scoop. And then David Pollock, I think, may have gotten really close to that. But, um, yeah, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop demands that we uh, no longer refer to it as the Alpha Pod. Or the Alpha Theropod. He wants it referred to as Theropodzilla, which, okay, well, I think he's right. Yeah. At, at the heart of it. What are we going to say? No. Yeah, he's the boss. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'm not trying to get fired off this show. And on that note, we want to especially thank our bosses, the Elite Eight, Mysterious, and Shrouded Illuminati members of our fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie Jr., Mint. The chairman of the board, Kayla Lansbury, David Data Scoop Vialon, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Dr. Ben Don, and ex officio board member Ali O'Dare. If you would like to hear this episode uncut and unedited and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, including Book Club, which we've been doing better with than historically we have, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. You can sign up for as little as a buck. And thank you all for supporting mental health. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to Jake Wiskirchen, who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Help us reach others by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash pod therapy or on Twitter at pod therapy guys and, of course, at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangeman. I'm Jim Jobin. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. La Nexto Semana, I think. Is that, is that and, how you, you and you taught Spanish, huh? I did. Years. <laughs> for years. Jesus. This shows you how weak Christian education is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't send your kids to a Christian school. <laughs> Jim will teach them Spanish. I just played a lot of Dora the Explorer and uh, the boy one.